What's going on guys? Welcome to NetSec Explain. In this video, I'm going to show you how to perform SQL injections for web app security testing. Now, to understand how SQL injections work, you first need to get a little familiar with SQL itself. SQL stands for Structured Query Language, and it's a pretty standard way of dealing with most common databases that are out there. It's built on a series of clauses, such as select from table where there is some value. So when it comes to SQL injection, our goal is to break out of these statements and find a way to add our own clauses to gain access to the database directly. In this example, we're going to walk through how to identify and exploit an SQL injection vulnerability in a black box setting. From there, we're going to be able to run our own queries, which we'll use later to learn how to map out the database structure itself. And finally, we're going to put it all together and log in as another user with stolen credentials. So let's get started. We're going to be using Dam Vulnerable Web App for this demonstration. And before we get started, we want to set the DVWA security setting to low. This will give us the simplest environment to work with. The first thing you want to do with any new application that you're trying to break is to get an idea of what the underlying source code looks like. Here, we can see the application looking for a user ID. We can type in a few different values and see that every time we change our input, our output changes. At this point, it's pretty clear that the application is calling from a backend database. So then, how does this database call look? If we were to rewrite this part of the application, we would use an SQL query somewhere along the lines of select some value from some table where user ID equals user ID. We don't know what the sum values are or what the sum table is, but we know that there are selecting data from a table where the user ID is taken from our input. Now that we have an idea of what our code looks like, we can try and play with our input to see how we can change the behavior of the application. For SQL, a common way of doing this is to enter tick or one equals one. If we place this in our demo code here, we can see that it treats or one equals one as part of the query itself, but we still have this extra tick that changes the semicolon. So what we need to do is add our own semicolon to the end and use a pound to common out the rest of the query. Now, some versions of SQL use a dash dash as their comment, so you'll have to play around with that to figure out which database is working on the back end. Let's copy our input here and enter it into the web application. And here, we can see all the possible results from this query. The input, or 1 equals 1, effectively changes the query to return queried information from the table where true, or where there is information to return. So what we just did here is the most basic version of an SQL injection attack. Let's try to take this another step further. If we can use the OR clause like this, then we should be able to use other SQL statements to rewrite our own queries. To do this, we're going to need to use the union clause to append our custom query to the end of the original results. But before we can do that, we're going to need to know the exact number of columns that are being asked for in the original request. So how do we figure this out? Well, we're going to need to use the order by clause. Order by asks the database to sort the results by column, and we can use it to find exactly how many columns the original query is asking for. For example, we would use order by four to sort by the fourth column. Now, if there is no fourth column to sort by, we'll either get an error or the query will fail. If we can sort by column three, but not column four, then that means that there are exactly three columns being requested. So let's try this out. We're going to type in a known user ID because we want to see if the query succeeds, fails, or returns an error. Then we're going to type in order by, and since we've been seeing first and surname being passed back to us, it's pretty easy to assume that we're at least requesting two columns. Okay, so order by two passes. Let's try order by three. Unknown column and order clause. Perfect, this is exactly what we wanted to see. Since our query passed at two columns but failed at three, we know that the original query is asking for exactly two columns. If we go back to our reconstruction of the original query, we can add in the columns requested as something one and something two. It's important to keep this updated as we move forward, not only for reporting, but also so that we can look at the code and try to find out more vulnerabilities within it. This is a simple example problem, but it's a good habit to get into before you start dealing with much larger applications. Now that we know the number of columns in the query, we can use union select to run our own separate select query. In the real world, the first select query you'll want to run is a list of numbers. 
What this will allow us to do is determine where in the web application each column will be presented. For a small web application like this, it's pretty easy to figure it out. But in larger applications, it's a little bit more difficult. Again, this is a good habit to get into. In real world applications, you'll sometimes need to check the HTML source to see if your numbers are put in there. I find that if it's a fairly complex web application, it's best to use numbers like 9999 or five nines, something that usually doesn't appear in web applications so that it's easy to find them. The next one or more queries you should use should output the database name, the username, and the version number. These will give you more details about the underlying database. Here we can craft a query that will union select all of those queries into one. Notice how I'm using null for the second column in each select statement. Remember, we have to request exactly the same number of columns as the original query every time. We see the database name as dbwa, the username as root at localhost, and the version number as 10.1.32 MariaDB. Now, here's the part where we start to map out the database. MySQL has an internal database called Information Schema, which stores metadata about the server itself. In here, it has the database mappings for all of the tables and all of the columns in all of the databases our user has access to. Since we're able to craft our own queries, we can ask it for information about our DVWA database. Let's try it out. We're going to start with union select table schema table name from information schema dot tables. Don't forget the semicolon and the pound at the end. Let's copy this into our browser. Don't forget to put a tick first so that we can execute our injection string. Run it and we can see all of the tables that are in each database. Now, this is a lot to sift through, so let's limit it down with the WHERE clause. We'll add WHERE table schema equals DBWA, and this is from our database name earlier. Throw that in there and we can see that the only tables in the DBWA database are guestbook and users. Now that we know the tables, let's go back and take a look at the column names in the users table, since that's likely the one to have stored credentials. We can make a new query with union select column name null from information schema dot columns where table name equals users. Throw that in the browser, don't forget the tick, and now we have all of the column names in the users table. We can see the first name, last name, user, password, and so on. Awesome. We're almost done. We even have enough information to completely rebuild our original query. Let's get a list of usernames and passwords and see if we can log in as one of them. Throw that in the browser and, oops, I, I meant to type in user, not users. Anyways, boom. We have everyone's username and password for the system. Now, these passwords might look a little funny. That's because they're hashed passwords. Hashing allows systems to store passwords in a secure way because they can't be reversed, but some hashes are stronger than others. With enough practice, you'll start to be able to point out the different types of hashes and what they look like. In the meantime, I'll just tell you, these are MD5 hashes. MD5 has been around for so long and it's been researched so much that it's not considered cryptographically secure anymore. And I'll show you why. I think I want to log in as this user, Leet. If we wanted to, we could save all of these hashes locally and use John the Ripper or Hashcat to try and crack them. But for weaker passwords, we can simply throw them into Google and see if somebody else has already done the legwork for you. Here, we can see the password hash for Leet decrypts to Charlie. So let's go ahead and log in. First, we need to log out and then log back in as 1337 with the password Charlie. And if we scroll to the bottom, we can see that we successfully logged in as Leet. Awesome. Looking at what we were just able to do, it was because of this single vulnerability in our web application that we were allowed to map out the entire database, collect user credentials, and log in as any other user in the system. Now, before I let you go, I want to briefly go over how to prevent something like this from happening in your applications. Looking at our finished original query, notice how the user ID was in line with the query itself. Because of this, we were able to escape it by adding a tick to escape the parameter and have the rest of our input treated as code. The only proper way to prevent an SQL injection like this is to use what is known as a prepared statement. A prepared statement builds the query ahead of time and then states where the variables are to be used as input. For example here, our prepared statement states that the user ID variable is a string and should be treated as such in the query. 
In the meantime, that's all I have for you guys today. For more information, check out the links in the description below, and don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos like this. I'll see you next time.